So in keeping with this notion of multiple perspectives, uh, we thought we would fill out the day um, hearing from the Department of Energy and the Research and Technology Group on the advisory side that's going on in that portion. And we have uh, Chris Smith, who's the Deputy Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, but he's in charge of oil and gas. Uh, he's also the industry co-chair or the government co-chair on the National Petroleum Council study that's looking at domestic resources. We have Dr. Uh, Charlie Williams. Uh, Charlie is the chief technology officer at Shell, and he deals with uh, deep uh, water well design and containment. But for purposes today, he will talk about the Joint Industry Task Force and the safety group that he leads in that Joint Industry Task Force and all the developments that have occurred um, over the last 10 or 11 months, uh, which have been substantial. As I mentioned earlier, uh, Mike Wallace is with us, and we asked Mike. Mike has recently joined CSIS as a senior advisor. Uh, Mike's the former COO of uh, Constellation, and he was head of the Constellation Nuclear Group. He was there at the creation of INPO, um, the nuclear uh, safety and regulatory group um, that kind of sets peer review and, and standards for the industry. And while it was painful, there's some useful lessons to learn. So it may not be the appropriate model, but we asked him to come by and just give his perspective on how that happened, what occurred, how companies stepped up, and how it evolved, and how long it took to actually get there. And then, of course, uh, Robin West, many of you know, Robin is the, the chairman and founder of PFC Energy. Um, he's also chairman now of the Institute of Peace, Institute for Peace. Um, he was an assistant secretary at the Interior Department and Oil and Gas and leasing activities were under his purview, so he's got a very different perspective as well. And we hope to continue that dialogue and discussion. For those of you that are looking for uh, Michael Bromwich's prepared remarks, we will have them posted on our website, hopefully within the next couple hours. Um, it was a long and detailed presentation, as Michael has wanted to do, but there's a lot of good information in there, so we want to make sure that that's available. So without further ado, um, further bios are in your handouts, but uh, let me welcome to the podium Chris Smith. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So how do I control this here? Bring yourself. Assume this is me. And then lower left. There you go. All right. <coughs> okay. Uh, thank you very much, Frank, for that uh, that kind introduction. Um, and I want to thank, for, thank you for the opportunity to come and, and speak to this group. Um, I've gotten to know Frank through our work with the, uh, the National Petroleum Council, so I've, uh, I've enjoyed working with you and your, uh, your experience. You understand how some of these, uh, these pieces fit together. Um, today I'm, I'm going to give you kind of a, a broad overview of some of the things that we're thinking about within the Department of Energy. Uh, our piece in this uh, complicated equation uh, I'll, I'll talk to you from a couple of uh, perspectives. Uh, first of all, I was the designated federal official for the, uh, the commission that was created by the president by executive order to look at the root causes of the BP, uh, BP Deepwater Horizon uh, disaster in the Gulf of Mexico. And secondly, um, I'm just coming yesterday from the first meeting of the Ocean Energy Safety Committee. Uh, which I sit on with, uh, with uh, Mr. Charlie Williams, who's going to be speaking today. Um, looking forward, that's going to be an organization that's going to uh, truly help us to look at how uh, we're going to take the immediate steps that have been taken by the Department of, in of uh, Interior to ensure that the appropriate uh, mechanisms, mechanisms are in place from a regulatory standpoint and augment that with the type of research and, and science that needs to be conducted to ensure that we understand the risks and that we are putting in place mechanisms to uh, mitigate them app appropriately. So my, uh, you know, my, my, my personal background, I, I spent a, a short time as, a, as an Army officer and spent uh, a number of years before coming into this role uh, working for an oil and gas company. So um, I have an appreciation for people who do difficult and, and, and dangerous work. And the, the folks who uh, supply the energy for our nation, for our economy, are certainly fit into that into that category. So as we went through the the look back of uh, trying to understand the root causes of the Deepwater Horizon, and put in place uh, research and development and uh, regulation to ensure it doesn't happen again, uh, we certainly had as a motivator the uh, the 11 individuals who lost their lives back uh, on April 20th of 2010, uh, a year ago now. So that's informed much of the work that we've done. Uh, and uh, you know, not only are we dedicated to making sure that we've, we're producing the energy that we need for our economy, 
uh, but also making sure that we do it in a, in a way that's, uh, that's safe and sustainable. So I, I'm going to talk just very briefly through some of what we observed as being some of the root causes. These are uh, observations that inform the work that we do within the Department of Energy uh, that we will bring to the Ocean um, Energy Safety Committee as that group uh, considers the work it needs to do going forward. So in, uh, in just very high level terms, you, you've got a, a, a number of balancing acts that you're trying to, to manage in order to uh, drill difficult wells in a way that's, that's safe. Uh, first, you have this simple, the, the, the simplest level of keeping the well under control is this balance between hydro, hydrostatic pressure and, and formation pressure, which uh, essentially means that you, you've got, you know, in, in the case of Deepwater Horizon, this rig that's floating in a mile of water, uh, there's a mile between the, the rig and the 5,000 feet beneath where the, you're at the, the mud line, and beneath that, another four miles down to the pay, to the, uh, the, the pay zone. And essentially through the drilling process, uh, you've got this five miles of fluid that's in this column that's in the, the well casing, uh, and the weight of that fluid has to be sufficient to counteract the force of uh, hydrocarbons trying to force away into the, into the well bore and get to the surface. Uh, that, in simplest terms, is uh, the, the first equation that you're trying to manage when you are uh, keeping the well under control. The second issue that was particularly important in this well uh, was this issue of pore pressure versus fracture gradient, which in, in simple terms is, is stating that you have to have enough weight, enough force in that, in that column of fluid to keep the formation under control, but not so much that you fracture the formation and you can create alternate pathways for hydrocarbons to flow uncontrolled up to the surface somewhere outside of the casing and the, and the well bore. So this was um, uh, a challenge that uh, existed in this particular well and that exists when you're drilling difficult, well, difficult wells. Uh, this is just a, you know, a cartoon schematic of the, 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 uh, the drill bit as it passes through the, uh, through the formation. But as, essentially, as you're, as you're drilling the well, you're constantly flowing uh, drilling mud down through that drill pipe, it circulates and comes back up the casing to the surface. Uh, you know how much fluid you're putting into the well, and therefore you know how much fluid you should be getting out. And if you're getting back out less than you're putting in, you suspect that you're uh, at some point along this, uh, uh, in your open hole, you're, 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 you're fracturing the formation. So this is something that occurred early on in this drilling process. Uh, it was something that informed all of the steps that, uh, that the, the companies took when they were drilling uh, the well eventually led to uh, the, 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 the accident. And as Secretary Chu and Secretary Salazar and, uh, and BP and all the other participants in the industry who were uh, helping us to, to resolve the crisis noted, uh, every step along the way when you're looking at different ways of capping the well, you're always concerned about this, this equation that you didn't want to make this situation worse. Uh, this is something that was resolved successfully in this case, but as was noted by Director Bromwich, as you go into more and more difficult situations and you get different challenges, uh, this is a, a, a moving target that you have to make sure that you, on an ongoing basis, understand the different types of risks that you have to deal with. Um, the third is this issue of data versus intuition, and this is something that the, uh, the committee yesterday spent some time talking about. Uh, you've got what you could consider the, you know, the, the technology, the hard science of understanding how uh, fluid passes through porous media, how fractures propagate, um, all of those things that technically you need to understand to drill a well safely. But you also have this, this uh, concern about human factors engineering, about how you take decision makers on the platform and allow them to make in real time uh, important decisions that are going to lead to your ability to control the well and keep uh, drilling safely. This is just a, a, a picture of the last two hours of the Sunsbury uh, data, which is measuring a number, number of things, you know, pressure and, and, and flow rates. You, you, you can't read this from where you're sitting, and that's it's kind, of, kind of the point. I mean, this is, this is actually uh, a you know, manifestation of the type of reading that the person on the platform has to read, follow, make decisions, and act upon those decisions in real time. Um, it was, for me, notable during the investigation itself when the lead counsel was up talking through the, uh, 
the investigation that they had, they had conducted. They, they took this diagram, they took this graphic, they, they blew it up, they cropped it, they spun it, they put arrows on it, so that you could see bits of key information that's hidden in this readout. There was uh, one point in particular where they noted that this was you know, one of the first tangible signs of a potential blowout where they had a slight increase in pressure on the drill pipe at a time in which the pump rate was steady. And in that condition, you would expect a, a more steady uh, pressure reading. And there was a slight increase, which is uh, captured here in, 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 in one of these arrows. But that is something that that individual who's on the platform, who's responsible for ensuring that the drilling is done safely, would have to see and note, interpret, and act upon in real time. Uh, if we look at the way that other systems operate you know, outside the oil and gas industry, be it the, the nuclear navy or the way we manage uh, uh, nuclear reactors or the way that we handle air, tra uh, air traffic control in, in congested airports, uh, similarly, you're dealing with tremendously complicated uh, quantities of data, and you're having to take that information, you're having to push it into uh, something that an operator, a skilled and conscientious operator, but, you know, a human being, has to be able to make decisions on. Uh, this isn't something that's unique to the Deepwater Horizon. I mean, this is the way that we, that we do things in, in, in oil and gas, and this is an area of research that I think that we can benefit from, from other areas that have to deal with complex and dynamic systems. And the, the last thing I'll mention is uh, the, the fail-safe barrier, which uh, was touched upon just briefly in the, in the last presentation. Um, we're still looking at uh, various studies that have looked at what actually happened with the BOP itself, the blowout preventer. Uh, the blowout preventer was considered to be that, that's your, your fail-safe device. In this case, it, it appears that uh, during the blowout, just the force of those hydrocarbons coming up the well bore was sufficient that it was able to elastically buckle the drill pipe such that it, it physically was not located within the cutting surface of the blind shear ram, which was supposed to cut that pipe and crimp it. it was, the, the BOP appears to have operated, right? the, the devices that were supposed to close on the, on the drill pipe closed. But the range of failure in which it had been previously tested wasn't sufficient, uh, was not sufficient to predict that it needed to operate in a, an environment that was, was, was this extreme. Again, th this was not a condition that was unique to this particular drilling rig or this particular drilling crew. Um, this was the blowout preventer that was uh, the, the, uh, the same type that's being, that's been used in, in, in other operations. So again, uh, this is another area of, of interest that uh, is being addressed by the Department of, of the Interior and, and their regulatory standards, and that uh, we will continue to look at as we go out into uh, deeper horizons, as we go and look for oil and gas in, in, more, in more difficult locations. So th th this is a, a, a one of the conclusions of the, the Oil Spill Commission. And again, the Oil Spill Commission was an independent, bipartisan organization that looked at root causes. And uh, you know, one, of, one of their conclusions was the immediate causes of the Macondo well blowout can be traced to a series of identifiable mistakes made by BP, Halliburton, and Transocean uh, that reveal such systematic failures in risk management that they place in doubt the safety culture of the entire industry. Um, there's, there have been some observers that have taken this quote and looked at this as a, as a strong statement. But when, when you really think about it, when you, when you think about the commonality between the operation as it existed on that platform, and there were mistakes were made, and there were, there were, there were problems, obviously, with that, with that particular operation. But there are many things, I think, we can identify uh, that we have to address uh, that are common. And the idea that we can focus very narrowly on one event, that we can relive that disaster and refight that battle and figure out how to deal with that specific incident and just move on and change nothing else is, is not the approach that we've taken. So that's a, a philosophy that's, that has informed the, uh, the work that's been taken by uh, the Department of Interior to make sure that they reform their regulatory environment and ensure that this doesn't happen again. And it's a spirit that informs the research that we're doing within the Department of Energy to make sure that we're not 
going back and refighting the old battle, but we're looking at new things that have to be uh, considered uh, as we move out into to more difficult frontiers. Um, we've had uh, a collaborative relationship uh, between the Department of Energy and the other uh, agencies that, that, uh, that, that, that operate in this space. Um, I won't uh, elaborate too much on the, the points here that, that uh, uh, Director Bromwich uh, talked about in, in, in great detail, uh, but I will highlight a couple of uh, comments that the, uh, has been made by the President in terms of uh, our commitment to make sure that we get this, get this right. Um, the first was a, a quote made by the President that were during, actually during the disaster, not too long after the well was blown out. Um, I continue to believe that domestic oil production is an important part of our overall strategy for energy security, uh, but I've always said that it must be done responsibly for the safety of our workers and the environment. Uh, that again was uh, during the time that Secretary Chu was down in the, the, uh, the Gulf of Mexico working with the teams to ensure that we, uh, uh, that we took care of the, uh, the problem. Um, and the second comes recently from the blueprint for America's energy future that, that, uh, that followed the President's energy speech in Georgetown uh, on the 30th of last month. Uh, when I was elected to this office, America imported 11 mil million barrels of oil a day. Uh, by a little more than a decade from now, we will have cut that by one third. That is something that, that we can achieve. Achieving that means that we have to get this, uh, 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 we have to get this right, uh, that we have to figure out how we can produce safely and move forward to, to commercialize this, this resource. Um, Director Bromwich gave you a, a couple of statistics about the progress that they've made in terms of changing the rules in the Gulf of Mexico to reflect uh, a mitigation of the risks as we see it, and their progress in uh, permitting wells as companies have made the steps and strides that they've asked for. So since the 28th of February, uh, 11 deep water, deep water wells and over 49 shallow water wells in, in that, in that uh, period of time since, uh, since last summer. So certainly this is something that, that we do have to solve. Uh, we have to do this. If you look at the places where new reserves are coming from, they're coming from the ultra deep water and they're coming from unconventional plays onshore. Uh, these are new frontiers in terms of opportunities, but they're also areas in which uh, we have to bring our understanding and our scientific uh, ability to, to quantify risks to bear. So those are the, uh, those are the comments that I had, Frank. I, I think I'll do we pass it on to the next uh, speaker, and then we'll take questions at the end. Yes. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, I was going to talk about the industry response to uh, post Macondo, and, and I was going to talk about the things that were proactively done in the industry following the Macondo incident and how those uh, have uh, contributed to uh, cooperation and, and communication and working you know, with the government agencies and, and the different investigative bodies that have uh, looked into Macondo as, as we evolve this. And so the things I'm going to talk about are the f uh, four industry task forces that were set up immediately after Macondo, subsea containment, which you know, was mentioned uh, uh, by uh, D Director Bromwich and others, well design, and then the Center for Offshore Safety. And so, you know, I get asked a lot, uh, so what's changed uh, post Macondo? And of course, I, you know, I, I, I'm tempted to put up one view graph and say everything, and then, you know, I, I, I'm uh, done with my talk. And, uh, but, and, and, and in lots of ways, you know, it is everything. I mean, there's been you know, a lot of, you know, very good, positive, uh, constructive uh, changes. But certainly there were a lot of good things, good standards, uh, good processes going on uh, before Macondo. And, and a lot of those have been enhanced and, and improved uh, post Macondo. So, um, you know, in a way it's everything. In, in a, but, you know, lots of other good things were going on. But the key thing I, I wanted to talk about is, so the other thing I get asked is, uh, you know, when's it going to be normal again? 
and uh, and Director Bromwich you know, also talked about this. But I mean, the the truth is, of course, it's never been normal. Uh, it's never been normal in the regard that the, the entire industry has been faced with um, increasing technical challenges, you know, deeper water, uh, Arctic, more remote operations, uh, deeper reservoirs, more difficult reservoirs. So we've had to evolve the technology on a continuing basis, uh, you know, for you know, it, it, through the, out the entire history of the industry. So actually, you know, in a way, you could say it's never been normal because we've always had to evolve things. Now, the other thing, of course, we, we evolve is the safety system, safety processes, environmental protections. And I think, the, you know, the, of course, the key in all of this is to evolve these in an appropriate manner and evolve these at the right speed uh, together. You know, you have to evolve your technology for uh, developing and uh, drilling for these uh, resources and develop your uh, safety and environmental uh, technology and uh, safety and environmental systems at the, at the same pace. So the key to all this is evolving these, you know, properly resourcing them and, and evolving them at the same pace. So immediately after Macondo and, you know, well in advance of any uh, investigations and in, in any commissions, you know, it was, a, it was apparent to the industry, that at least the areas that needed to be worked on. And so immediately we saw that we needed to work on spill response capability, you know, well containment and intervention industry and industry drilling standards, you know, all with the mission of continuing to be able to, you know, safely drill, and safely do our operations in, uh, in deep water. So to that end, there was actually four task groups set up in the industry. There was one on offshore equipment, you know, one on offshore procedures, one on subsea well control and containment, and then one on oil spill preparedness and response. And all of these task groups are continuing to, um, to work today. You know, they were set up then and they're continuing to work today. When, when we uh, first set these up, they were staffed by the entire industry, contractors, uh, drilling contractors, uh, producing companies, uh, service and supply companies. And so, the, you know, these were broadly staffed by the industry with um, doing, you know, what we could do and doing what we knew at the time to, uh, to address uh, improvements that, that should be made and enhancements that should be made post Macondo. So we, you know, once we got into this, then it, these have evolved and, and, and it evolved in quite a useful way because as, as we get more and more information back from all the commissions and reports, we can use these to address that. And also it's a great place where we've worked with the BOEM to uh, understand and respond to the, to the NTLs and new rules and regulations and actually to, to discuss and work with them over uh, the new rules and, and regulations. So it's been a great you know, format for being able to do that as well. Now fundamentally, you know, I wanted to mention uh, that most of the work of these groups you know, ends up resulting in an industry standard or, an, or a recommended practice. And the industry standards in the U.S. You know, are not completely but predominantly done through the API. You know, the API was set up in 1920 specifically to do industry standards. And the, um, the part of the API that does industry standards is completely separate from the uh, lobbying part of API. And in fact, these standards are written collaboratively by the industry, broad representation in the industry. And you know, this is controlled by the American National Standards Institute practices for openness and, and complete representation and, and how these are created. So the work of these groups is generally resulting in these standards. And if you look at, at uh, standards in the, in the U.S., there's two, 235 that, that affect uh, exploration and production, and of those 80 are referenced in the regulations. And, and Director Bromwich mentioned that earlier about the importance of having good standards that could be, you know, part of, uh, of regulation. So I wanted to be sure and, um, and mention that. So, you know, why were the task forces formed and what are they going to do? I, I, I think I already mentioned that, but, they, but we really looked for gaps and places that we needed to make improvements in the areas I mentioned. Uh, we, we really wanted to focus on R&D and we wanted to focus on creating these uh, procedures and practices. And, we, and, when, and especially when we wanted to in, be able to enhance our performance in, in safety and, and protecting the environment. So I thought I'd go through, and I can save a lot of time here because a lot of these you know, have a lot of technical information, but I wanted to give you a flavor. I was going to go through each one of these task groups 
and talk a little bit about what they were working on just so that you could see that the work is um, uh, directly affected or directly aimed at the things that you you see in the press, you see in the uh, in the various investigative commissions, and so that you know this is uh, topical work. So here's the offshore equipment task force. The main work of that group is on the blowout preventers, and they're looking at you know shearing capabilities, acoustic uh, oper you know systems, ROV interfaces, and um, several other things. One of them, uh, the third bullet there in the middle, uh, clarifications of guidelines between the people that own the BOPs, which are the rig contractors, and OEMs, original equipment manufacturer. Those are the people that built the, the, the BOPs. So clarifying the guidelines on how th those people should share information and work together. And the result is working on this fourth edition of API RP53, which is the recommended practices for blowout prevention equipment. And one of the things is we're converting this recommended practice into a standard from a recommended practice. And this has a lot of benefits, but one of them is, uh, the, for those of you that might have been watching it, there was some discussion about recommended practices often have options and you can choose from options. Uh, so when you convert this to a standard, you remove this, uh, this uh, discussion about you know, which option do you choose when you convert it to a standard. So that works ongoing. So, uh, but there were lots of proactive things that happened as well. So it was proactive that we set up this group to start working on, uh, on blowout preventers. You know, lots of companies in, in certain circumstances have said they're going to move to two shear rams in, in you know, certain places and certain kinds of rigs in advance of what's probably going to be regulation about two shear rams. Uh, lots of companies have looked at, at the uh, interface, but the ROVs or the remote submarines that can activate blowout preventers have looked at at uh, changing the interfaces on those and actually changing the ROV so they have more capacity to interact with blowout preventers. And then of course, uh, usually when I give this talk, I talk about the new regulations, but uh, since Director Bromwich is here, I wasn't. But there's a, you know, there's a host of new regulations that also affect you know, what's changed in the industry. He mentioned some of them, but they're about witnessing of tests and in particular about third-party certification and verification about the BOPs themselves and the, and the fact that they're you know, suitable for the service they're going in. The next one I was going to talk about was uh, Offshore Procedures Task Force, and there's several different, you know, parts to what's going on here. You know, one of them, I'll skip to the one at the bottom first, it's API RP65 Part 2, and you can see this is talking about isolating potential flow. This document was really originally, it's, it's all about cementing and proper cementing practice primarily. It was originally written uh, to uh, have a, a stand or a recommended practice about the issue of uh, isolating uh, hydrocarbons and in, in production out you know behind the pipe it's now been modified and we're working on the second edition and it talks about also isolating flow inside the pipe so it talks about barriers and all that should be inside uh, the pipe as well the other one I was going to skip up to is RP 96 which is actually new and it's a recommended practice around how you design deep water wells so these were all pretty timely. I'm going to skip through this really fast, but things that are in this RP96 document that's being worked are certainly things like design considerations, load cases are talking about the pressures, temperatures, and weights that are on the pipe. But some of the things that, that you'll recognize are barrier philosophy and how many, what kind of barriers you need. It also discusses, you see the third from the bottom, displacements, which is a thing that's been talked a lot about in the commission report and has recommended practices about displacing uh, wells and how you displace wells, which is the process of removing the heavy weighted mud that Chris talked about to control the well and putting in uh, lighter fluids, which was discussed a lot in, in Macondo. Uh, some things about changes, uh, you know, proactive changes. One of the things that there's a lot of emphasis on now in the industry is uh, having designs where you can directly install a capping stack and shut the well in. Uh, in the new regulations, there's quite a few things. I want to talk about this level one and level two later, but um, you know, one of the things is the professional engineer certifications and the two you know, independent tested barriers, and there's quite a bit you know, that, that, that has uh, changed. Um, API 97 is the well construction interface document, and I want to spend a you know, minute with this because Center for Offshore Safety I've done a lot of work on, and, and this is a key component of this. And so I don't know if anybody heard me talk last time I was here. I talked about safety cases or HSE cases, 
And this is, an, you know, really, to me, an extremely important part of uh, safety management and, and part of that system. And you can see what it says is, is that it bridges between the safety case or HSE case of the drilling contractor, which generally in drilling owns this safety case, and the operator who has a whole safety management system. And so what, what does that mean? You know, it, it's tough to put this in a diagram, so, but, but Bulletin 97, the bridging document, exists in the middle. So you have the drilling contractor on the left who goes through, identifies the risk, identifies the barriers, identifies the uh, mitigations uh, in, in case uh, you had an, uh, a risk that went all the way to an incident. And, and then some people talk about as the bow tie analysis. The uh, operator who's contracted for the rig has a whole safety case, and, and I mean, it has a whole safety management system as well. And all the contractors also have safety management systems or in fact safety cases. So one of the keys on the, on the location where you have multiple contractors, including the drilling contractor working together, is to bridge between all these safety management systems so that people understand uh, which safety management systems are, you know, are which, uh, are, you know, understand the safety case and understand what their responsibilities are and understand how you you share this response to safety and how you you know what your you know specific responsibilities are and and what uh, are the the rules that are going to going to be the rules that that dominate in different situations on this well and one of the key things about 97 is, is that it's in fact well specific so it only not only talks about general drilling risk but it talks about specific well risk Subsea con well control and containment task force uh, really ultimately ended up in the con in the containment companies and containment systems predominantly. So I won't say much about that. Although there is more work to do there, because there hasn't been a lot of work done on intervening within subsea wells and some other things that need to be done later on. Oil spill response was the fourth and the last one, uh, but. Uh, you know, there's really 20 working groups here. There's been a, a tremendous amount of work done here as well. Each of those uh, working groups, you know, has uh, plans for how to address things in the future. There's been a, a new group set up. There's always been a collaborative group between stakeholders in the government and oil spill response uh, standards and organizations. That's really been strengthened. But the key thing is uh, the plan that's already, uh, uh, you, know, st you know, starting to, to, to uh, be evolved and, and a lot of this uh, capacity is, you know, is, is coming to pass, but you can see the offshore capability for spill cleanup, you can see vessels uh, seven to eight, you know, we're gonna go from seven to 18, better technology about finding the oil and looking at, at the thickness of the, of, the, uh, of the spill, new technology around the skimmers and increased uh, boom capacity, increased uh, vessels of opportunity, and you can see all, of, all across the board, there's gonna be a huge increase in, in the effectiveness and the capacity and capability to, to respond to oil spills. And, <coughs> Excuse me. One picture I wanted to show is uh, X-band radar and infrared camera. So X-band radar can be used to find these uh, these spills, you know, even at night. So it's a really useful tool for finding them. And and then the infrared camera can actually look at the thickness because you want to go after the thickest, you know, part of the of the spill first. So there's a lot of new <coughs> technology, including this capability to to, to work at night. <coughs> so we talked about the four task force. And uh, now I'm just going to talk about uh, the containment briefly because it's another thing that this was done completely proactively following a Macondo and the industry uh, said that, you know, we have to have subsea containment systems to, to respond to, uh, to an incident if, you know, if it, one ever happens in the, in the future. And uh, as mentioned, there was two responses, Helix, you know, which has some members, you know, has a response system and then uh, Marine Well Containment Company uh, which is going to invest over a billion dollars as an interim system that's available now. And I won't go into a lot of detail on what the interim system is, but it shows you at least a picture of what the interim system uh, is. And uh, then it, it's, uh, you know, we're constructing right now. I, I might mention, though, because maybe you've seen it in the press, on the camping stack, some of the system is equipment used to, to respond to the Macondo incident, and some of this equipment is new built uh, equipment like the camping stack that has increased capability. And then we have an expanded system that's underway that's entirely you know, purpose-built, purpose-designed 
to respond in up to 10,000 feet of water, up to 100,000 barrels a day that'll be, you know, available and ready to deploy, uh, you know, within a few days of an, of an incident. And so that's uh, underway right now. And, and, but as we built this, there was a, a tremendous amount of work done with BOEM. They issued NTL-10, which and NTL-10 says you have to demonstrate that you have the capacity to, and the capability of doing this. And there was a lot of work with them around what does that mean and you know, what capacity do we need and a lot of uh, beneficial work to, to arrive at, at what we have today and uh, making sure that everybody had the uh, confidence and assurance that it was a, a good system and, and could be deployed. And I, and I definitely won't uh, attempt to read this one, but I wanted to put this one up here because, you know, it, it, there was a lot of, of use, useful benefits that came out of this. This actually, this talks about level one, level two casing design, and the BOEM talks quite a bit about this because this is a useful tool for looking at how you design wells and how you differentiate designs on wells depending on whether you can cap and shut them in immediately or, you know, you have to go to an advanced design. And this has been very, you know, beneficial in, in, in the industry and with the BOEM on helping people think about the way they design wells and they need to design wells for capping and shutting in. And I just wanted to mention this because this, you know, this really goes back into RP96, the well design. It has a big impact on that, but it really flowed out of the work on containment. So all of these task groups have actually worked together to, de to deliver things. Uh, the last thing, and I, I shouldn't have left it for last because it's one of my favorite things to talk about, is Center for Offshore Safety. And I'll just say briefly that this is a by the industry, for the industry center that's going to be set up entirely focused on safety. And you can uh, you know, see that you know, one of the, the keys here is, is effective leadership, communication, teamwork, and utilizing uh, discipline safety management, and then third-party auditing. So in advance of the requirement to do uh, having your safety environmental management systems audited by a third party, you know, we agreed to get together, form the, the center and the industry, all the members of this would agree to be audited by third parties and have their uh, safety environmental management systems audited by third parties. <clears throat> the other you know, key part of the, of the center is a place to share best practices, a place to accumulate uh, learnings in the industry, a place to have a dialogue with all the key stakeholders about safety and environmental uh, performance, including the government. There's going to be an, uh, an advisory commi committee of uh, key stakeholders. There's going to be a governing board made up of a broad spectrum of the industry, and, um, it's, and this is open to uh, anyone that, uh, that wants to, to join the, the center, and we're in the process of setting this up right now. So thank you very much. Charlie, your presentations are always jam-packed, and after I take them back and look on reflection, I think of 10 more questions, but this is uh, really helpful and very useful. I'm trying to pick how they named it. There's one called Mike Wall, so at the bottom it's already open. Oh, there it is. There you go. Good morning. As uh, Frank indicated in the introduction, my background is all in nuclear power, nuclear navy, submarines, building, operating, actually shutting down and decommissioning nuclear plants. That's what I've been doing for 41 years. And so I was involved very early on uh, when we had the uh, troubling events at Three Mile Island and I've been very much involved with industry uh, many times in leadership positions along the way. So my intent is to share with you, uh, if you will, the perspective of what the nuclear industry went through, not necessarily providing it as a commentary uh, with direct relevance uh, to the uh, situation here, but I, I think you'll see uh, where there are points of attachment, where there may be relevance, and in fact, as I've just heard from the last couple of slides, uh, maybe some real uh, connectedness on what happened in the nuclear industry and what the oil and gas industry is now doing. Um, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations was founded and self-regulation of the U.S. commercial nuclear industry began uh, with the crisis at Three Mile Island in 1979. Partial core meltdown, 
Uh, it was the worst accident that we had or have had. Uh, even though it was preceded by 40 years of reactor operation, uh, and at that time we had 70 reactors uh, that were operating. Subsequent to Three Mile Island, although there were no deaths, no injuries, no environmental damage, nevertheless, 100 nuclear plants that were planned or under construction were canceled, uh, and we haven't built a new nuclear plant in the U.S. in 32 years. So there was a long impact uh, that this had on the industry. Um, immediately following uh, the Three Mile Island event and before it was even fully understood, key industry leaders took steps to form IMPO in less than six months. It was clear that there needed to be a very significant new approach for the entire U.S. nuclear industry that prior to that uh, was was regulated by the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, but, but operated by individual utilities with no terrific connectedness between them. In forming IMPO, uh, the industry and IMPO set up the four cornerstone programs that you see listed there, and I'll talk more about them as I go through evaluations, training, analysis, and assistance. Those were set up 32 years ago, and they still exist today. IMPO is a non-government uh, entity. It is independent of the industry, and legally and philosophically, it cannot advocate for the industry. It's a self-regulation uh, entity intended to look specifically at nuclear safety. Uh, the role, as you see in the bottom line there, is, is to help the industry set and achieve high standards for safety and excellence in performance. Uh, in fact, the mission is not to meet regulatory requirements, it's to promote and achieve excellence beyond regulatory requirements. Over the course of the 32 years, uh, we have come to view IMPO as, frankly, a, a tremendous success for the U.S. nuclear industry. And as we look back uh, more recently, there really are five key factors uh, that we believe are the elements for why IMPO has been so successful. And at the very end, I'll give you objective measures of the where we were in 1980 and where we are today uh, so that you can see what that success actually looks like. I'm going to step through each of these five measures in just a little bit of detail. The number one and most critical success factor was and is CEO engagement. Uh, and it is intense. Uh, there's support and personal involvement from every CEO at each of the 26 member entities. Uh, we have today 26 uh, utilities or entities that operate nuclear plants. There are 104 nuclear plants across 31 states. All those CEOs are very personally involved in IMPO. Uh, it's expected and frankly, peer pressure, it's demanded, and it has been that way for some time. The board of IMPO is comprised of CEOs at, at the very high holding company level or at the least CEOs or presidents of subsidiaries that are principally the nuclear operating companies. IMPO performs evaluations of our plants about every two years when they do, they have about a six-month preparatory process away from the site uh, with data gathering from the site. They come to the site with a team of about 25 people for two weeks. Uh, they then go away, bring their observations and hard data together, and determine what their findings and recommendations are about performance. The briefing of all that is then done back in the headquarters of the uh, operating company uh, to the CEO with line management present. It's a very important dynamic. IMPO reports their findings to the CEO uh, with the line managers in the room uh, rather than reporting it, uh, if you will, several levels down the organization. There are regular communications and requests made directly at the CEO level by the president of IMPO. Good example is last fall. 
uh, Impo, uh, in performing regular analysis of the industry, identified some disturbing trends. Uh, the president of Impo sent a letter directly to each of the CEOs and requested them to provide a personal response back uh, for the nature of the trends and what they would do to assure such trends were addressed at their utility. Those responses are not responses that are moved three levels down the organization and some staff group puts it together. The expectation is the CEO will convene his leadership, address the issues, determine what will be done, and personally respond back to the president um, of IMPO. We have a conference once a year. There is 100% participation of all CEOs. When I came to Constellation Energy as the president of the Generation Group uh, nine years ago, uh, my CEO, who was from the banking industry, was besieged by requests to go to conferences for Edison Electric Institute, NEI, IMPO, EPRI, uh, all kinds. And, and he got a request from IMPO for the CEO conference and said, do I really need to go to this? It's kind of nuclear specific. I said, if you only go to one meeting in the entire year, in the industry, you have to go to the Impo CEO conference. He did, he tells well the story having attended that first meeting because a key part of that CEO conference is what's called the executive session. Uh, it involves only the CEOs, picture about one third the size of this room with the presidents of, uh, but not the operating line people. They're in the room, and IMPO reviews the performance of the U.S. fleet, uh, points out those who are having problems of one sort or another, generally requests the utilities or operating entities having problems for that CEO to come up uh, and explain to his peers uh, why it is he's having problems and what he's going to do about it. It is an intense CEO to CEO peer accountability session. It, it is at the heart uh, of what gives thrust and credibility to IMPO in their ability to be our self-regulator. Second principal reason for success is nuclear safety and the focus on nuclear safety. Uh, promoting the highest levels of safety and reliability is what IMPO is all about. They don't do anything else. They don't advocate for the industry. They don't recruit for the industry. They don't train. They don't advertise. They simply focus on safety of plant operations. They have a staff of 400 in Atlanta. They have a budget of $100 million. Uh, and in that staff of 400, about 60 are actually industry loaned executives or managers who go to IMPO typically for a period of 18 months, during which time they are considered a full IMPO employee. Uh, and the benefits of that are they give to IMPO a refreshing of exactly what the issues are in the industry, but they also get from IMPO the intensity of the discipline with which uh, oversight and evaluations are done and safety standards are set. Um, the focus is exclusively on excellence in nuclear power safety. Um, we've been at this 32 years. If you go back 10 years ago, uh, and of course I was in the industry very much then, the discussion was among the people in the plants, uh, what do you want? A good operational performance, reliability and low costs, or safety? You can't have both. If you want high safety, then uh, the plant's not going to operate so much and the budget's going to go up. 32 years of experience, and, and we are replete with objective data to show this is, the most intense focus on safety, in fact, creates the lowest operating costs and the highest plant reliability. And, and the reasons for that are it becomes a cultural intensity for how we do things at our plants. Safety, safety, safety personnel safety, and reactor safety. And there is absolutely no compromising ever either one. Everybody knows it. It's an immediately dischargeable offense if you even begin to look like you're crossing over the line. And what happens is the whole workforce at the plant knows its safety above all, and that's how we focus. 
and they will be backed by their management should they make any decisions uh, that impact on the plant. It leads to the workforce taking tremendous personal accountability for how they do their work. We have a tremendous industrial safety record. You're more likely to have an accident working in an office than you are working in a nuclear power plant. Facts bear that out. We have a tremendous nuclear safety record in the way our plants have operated, and, and the, the data bears that out. Ten years ago it was questioned. Today there's no question because we have the feedback loop of the data of history that is showing safety is number one, what we need to focus on if what we want is top performance. Support from the industry has been tremendous. This is about self-regulation. Uh, Impo with some peers looks at our plants and tells us what our problems are. They're very intrusive. They're very comprehensive. Uh, industry participates in developing the standards, but at the end of the day, Impo makes the decisions under the governance of their board, which is CEOs from the nuclear industry. They hire competent and experienced staff, not at all um, infrequent that people go from an industry position into IMPO and vice versa. Uh, and of course we have the Navy nuclear program as a source of talent as well and the standards there are equally matched to what we have in the industry. Um, they deliver evaluations that are very, very hard hitting. Uh, if the glass is 90% full, we don't talk about the 90%. The discussion is all about the 10%. It's always about where is there a gap, where are you falling short, uh, and there's no balancing, if you will, of where you're otherwise doing well. And what we've found over 32 years is by focusing intensely on those gaps, we in fact can close them. Safety improves, performance improves, costs go down, uh, and that's the ultimate objective that we want to get from it. Accountability. After the first five years, uh, 1984, IMPO was having a tough time. Uh, some in the industry didn't quite accept this whole notion of self-regulation and that IMPO would tell them what to do. Uh, I wouldn't call it a fracturing, but there certainly wasn't a, a group hug uh, on IMPO at that time. So a separate uh, CEO task force was established just to evaluate IMPO. Uh, and when they completed that review, uh, what in fact they caused to happen is IMPO was made even stronger. They were given more authority. I'll talk to some of that in a minute. Uh, they were made to demand more accountability for performance. And frankly, it built credibility with the regulator uh, as well as with our public. The reports or the evaluations of individual science sites are absolutely confidential and we're pedantic about keeping them that way. Uh, that's how they're able to be very candid. They're not even shared from plant to plant. Uh, they are shared with the NRC in an informal way so that they're full aware of uh, the issues the plant may be addressing. Um, IMPO can pressure people to shut down plants. They don't have authority to shut down the plants. Uh, but they can bring the pressure to cause that to happen. And importantly, and there are a few notable stories in the industry, where energy companies were not making fast enough progress to improve performance of nuclear plants, IMPO has authority by their procedures to jump the CEO and go directly to the board of directors. They have done that several times. Uh, and there have been senior executives in the industry who no longer continued in their position by virtue of, of that activity. And certainly there are many uh, executives below the top executive who have lost their jobs because they didn't quite get uh, on with the program or moving performance improvement aggressively enough. And then finally, every nuclear plant in the US is insured uh, by the Nuclear Electric Insurance Limited insurance company. And they set their premiums on the basis of the IMPO evaluations, and if you score the worst score at IMPO, which nobody has in 32 years, but if you do, 
then Neil pulls your insurance and you're forced to shut down. So IMPO, in effect, can cause a plant shutdown and everybody knows that's how the system works. Independence, um, skip this, I mentioned that we're independent of the NRC uh, and yet our programs, training is a good example, are endorsed by the NRC so there's not a body of NRC regulatory requirement that goes uh, further into that area. So where are we after 30 years? This is the punchline. Um, Self-regulation has led to significant improvement, but there is an intensity uh, that the words don't do justice as I describe what uh, critical challenge uh, and accountability is really all about and this intense focus on nuclear safety. In the 80s, capacity factor, which is merely the measure of how, what percent of time the plant is actually operating. If it ran all the time, that'd be 100%. You can't do that because you have to shut down sometimes to change the fuel, uh, but that's, that's the measure of how well we're doing. A scram is when the reactor automatically shuts down because something malfunctioned, and radiation exposure uh, you're all familiar with. Today, the typical plant has 91%. Uh, my fleet, Constellation Energy, that I'm just leaving, uh, is the number one fleet in the country with 95% capacity factor across our five units. There are no automatic scrams anymore uh, because of the way performance has improved and the radiation received by our workers is one-sixth what it was in the 80s and in the 80s of course it was still within regulatory uh, guidelines. We still, all that said, we still see problems once in a while and when we do there is a swarm focus on the problem so as to drain down the corrective actions that should be taken and every one of the utilities assumes that problem happened to them and addresses those corrective actions as if they were actually at their plant. It's all about closing the gap. Um, and most recently, we're beyond the harder uh, technical activities, uh, the disciplines, and we're getting into the soft side. We have been for about uh, five years. Safety culture uh, is a, an easy buzzword, uh, but in the nuclear industry, uh, it takes on an awful lot of meaning. So with that, I'm going to stop. Bottom line is, for us, self-regulation works. It has produced business objectives that are far beyond what we had in the 80s. Uh, and uh, we believe that um, it's what we're going to continue uh, definitely to do to raise our level of performance yet further. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mike. That's exactly what we were hoping for in terms of the perspective on IMPO. I see a lot of similarity and applicability. Then I also see we're in our industry, or the oil and gas industry. I keep reverting back. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that when you look at intellectual property rights, number of competitors, services, that kind of stuff, it might be slightly different. Robin. So we asked Robin here today because he's one of the few people that has this perspective of having been in the interior department and managed some of these programs and looked at the industry side both from a financial perspective and as well as a security and performance uh, perspective. So it's always great to have you here and I'm looking forward to your remarks. Thank you, Frank. Um, I'm listed as a commentator and I said, what does that mean? And he said, well, you don't have any slides in your last. <laughs> uh, and uh, I see some people slightly, um, so I will try and move through this very briskly. Um, Basically, um, I, I, let me uh, have a disclaimer. I used to run the offshore leasing program from 81 to 83 when I was from seven to nine years of age. Um, and uh, uh, my company works with most of the companies involved in the offshore, including BP. But we've been very, very much involved in this for a long time. A couple points. Obviously, the Macondo well was a terrible tragedy and it was a huge mess. I think Mike Bromwich has a very, very tough job and he, is, uh, uh, he inherited a colossal chaos, uh, and he's been trying to work through it. One of my observations going back to when I ran the program is this, this program runs the risk from two sides. One side is what I call unloving critics, and the other uncritical lovers. And frankly, if left to either one, they'll destroy the program. Um, one of the things we've learned in, uh, I think, since the spill, the public has generally learned, is that the offshore industry is a colossal industry. It is one of the largest, most capital intensive, most technologically advanced industries anywhere in the world. 
Uh, a lot of people are just stunned. They had no idea how big it is. Uh, uh, compared to the nuclear industry, for example, it's important to recognize that each one of these plants costs, uh, offshore fields costs, you know, uh, the platform, the whole field development is, you know, anywhere from you know, one is a very small pr uh, project to five or six billion. I mean, it's almost like each, uh, each one is on the scale of a nuclear plant. It's a huge program. Um, the other thing is, is that technology is changing very, very rapidly. Um, and um, it's going deeper and farther with higher pressures. Uh, technology and how these projects are managed, this isn't static. It's very, very dynamic, and I'll come back to this. Um, the, the good news was that the industry had an extraordinary safety record. It produced over 24 billion barrels of oil offshore with 1,715 barrels spilled between 69 and 2009. That was the good news. The bad news is there was 24 billion barrels were produced offshore with 1,715 barrels, and people thought this could never happen, um, and it happened. Um, and clearly, in certain respects, such as well containment and uh, spill cleanup, the industry wasn't ready, the government wasn't ready, no one was ready for a, a crisis of this scale and complexity. If you listen to Admiral Allen and the problems that the government had, the politicians got in the act, the media said things which were uh, as the Financial Times said, ludicrous, um, and um, uh, people clearly weren't ready for something like this. And, um, you know, there was a lot of politics, and people were trying to embarrass each other on both sides, and it was all very unfortunate. Um, the, uh, I think one of the things that people have uh, kind of glossed over is, and one of the points I've tried to push from day one, is this notion that other countries have gone through disasters as well. Um, and the experience of what happened in the UK with Piper Alpha, uh, which was there's a much greater loss of life. Um, the, f the, the, the whole platform, the huge platform, just blew up. Over 180 people were killed. Um, and um, um, what happened was that um, the British went through a very serious process, and they decided to change their entire approach to regulation. And I would argue this has been the fundamental lesson that has not been learned in this country uh, in the last year. What the Brits did was that they shifted from a highly prescriptive uh, program where you had guys with clipboards climbing all over platforms, uh, checking the boxes to see if you had complied, and they shifted to something called safety case. And what safety case did was it shifted the risk uh, from the government and from specific compliance they shifted to companies and said, you have to anticipate the risk. Charlie, on uh, slide 14, I noted down the slide number, talked about bow tie. Um, basically what it does is that it, it creates the, the um, really, the burden is on the companies to demonstrate that they uh, have anticipated everything. It not only the, the operators, but the service companies. Um, one of the striking elements of the U.S. regulation was there's very little emphasis on the service companies. Um, and what you're trying to do is, again, going back to the point, this is a gigantic, dynamic industry. And how on earth is a small, underfunded government regulator supposed to manage it? Answer, it can't. Um, and uh, that's not a fault of anybody. It's a fault of the fundamental approach. Um, and I would argue that the genius of safety case is that it tries to lever off of the, uh, of, the, um, of the industry, of the skill of the industry, to make sure that safety is maintained. This does not mean that it's self-regulation by the industry. This is not cutting regulation. It's actually a tougher and more rigorous program. But it's been very effective, and the numbers show up. And a number of companies, such as Shell, operate worldwide f internally for their own purposes on safety case, and, and they find it works very well. And so uh, I would argue that, that we, 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 we really actually haven't learned very much. Um, and this is not, I'm not faulting Director Bromwich or anything like this, is we should change how we do it. And um, the, um, um, a couple of other points um, aside from that is that uh, one is that I, I agree entirely with uh, the uh, uh, with Mike Bromwich that Boomer is underfunded. If there ever was a false economy, um, that uh, uh, this agency is not properly funded. With all immodesty, the last time the agency was properly funded 
was in the 1984 budget, which I prepared. Um, but the fact of the matter is, I think that given the budgetary situation, given the scale of the complexity of this industry, is that a formula has to be found whereby the industry participates in funding this. If they don't, if you want good regulation, if you want efficient regulation, you're going to have to pay for it. Now, this has to be a system that gives the public confidence. I'm not saying that the industry buy the regulator. What I'm saying is that funds have to be found. And to, uh, if there ever was sort of penny wise and pound foolish, not putting a couple hundred million dollars into this and slowing down this whole program, I think, um, makes no sense at all. One of the points I would also make is this, this notion of, uh, and I'll finish here, is that the industry has to be depoliticized. Uh, again, the unloving critics and the uncritical lovers. One of the things, um, uh, my sense is that uh, uh, Director Bromwich has spent a lot of time uh, trying to recruit people. I think that the treatment of the people who worked in MMS was shocking, um, and that you had honorable people who worked hard. Um, and um, they said, well, there was sex, drugs, and rock and roll in the MMS. It was in the Denver office, and last time I looked, there really wasn't a lot of offshore production in Colorado. Um, and um, I just think that uh, treating these people like that, I think, really was shameful. Um, and um, I note with interest, everyone talks about the revolving door and conflict of interest. All you have to do is pick up the Washington Post. The deputy general counsel of CFTC went to Baker and Botts on Monday. Um, I, you know, th this whole town, the whole government works that way. And to humiliate these people, I think, was really wrong. I think another element where politicians uh, were trying to score points was the use it or lose it argument, which I think demonstrated absolutely willful ignorance of how this program works. Uh, it was really inexcusable. Um, and um, my last point is that I, I, before I ran the offshore program, I worked in the White House, and I was um, in charge of presidential boards and commissions. And usually presidential boards and commissions are an excuse to just buy time and not do anything. Um, but I would argue that um, uh, if you really want this program to work properly, to take it out of politics and to have substantive alterations, set up a presidential commission which is bipartisan, which has people nominated by Congress, by the president, from the industry, from the environmental community, and from the states who are expert and bipartisan. Frankly, the Spill Commission was not bipartisan, and it was not expert. Um, and uh, I think that um, that's one of the reasons why some of the findings were rejected. So I think to create a kind of commission to work through this, to really think through a whole different approach um, um, is really going to be critical. Or this program, which is such an important program, um, it's an important source of revenue, it's an important source of our energy security, um, how do you get it out of politics and how do you optimize it? And I think uh, unless you do things like this, this, this level of, of of controversy and uh, politics, which I think is very unproductive and very unfortunate, will continue. So. Okay. So I guess we have a little fodder for questions. Um, <laughs> one of the problems with this room is no matter what configuration we put it in, there's always a blind spot. So let me do this. Um, we're going to take uh, three or four questions so we can get our panel out so that the, and other people that have lunch commitments and uh, identify yourself ask a question if there's other areas you want to explore, and then we'll try to get to it. Certainly, go ahead. We'll start up here, and then we'll go one back. Yeah, it's coming up. No, right here. Right. Robert Schroeder with International Investor. Uh, maybe I can sneak two quick ones in. Uh, uh, Charlie Williams, is it? Uh, you've been in the industry long enough. You've seen enough people, players, rigs. You can exclude your own company. You don't have to name names. But if you were to put a scale up, 10 being the absolute most consistent in terms of safety, one being sheer disregard for safety, where, where would you say rigs fall? Are they in the five to seven, or are they run from one to nine? And the second one would be, next time we have a disaster, Mr. Smith, are we going to have a government that doesn't rely on corporate robots, corporate cameras, to go down and give us the video feeds? Are we going to have our own so that we can really get our own independent information? And that includes probably as far as uh, security is concerned too, because I understand even to this day, BP disallows people from entering certain parts of the Gulf. 
are we going to have our own means to do this and not have to rely on second party corporate people to do it for us? So, oh, well, you know, I'd say I really don't, you know, have the data myself to, to answer the, the, the question. You know, but, we're, you know, we're going to, you know, one of the things that the uh, safety, uh, Center for Offshore Safety is going to do is, in fact, collect safety statistics and collect these audit statistics and, and have a, a unified report around the, the state of the industry that's going to be really useful for, you know, future discussions both within the industry and, you know, with regulators and with the government. You know, I, I guess what I would say is that, that you know, certainly, um, you know, all the, the, the modern rigs, uh, you know, I think, you know, mo most people and in, 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 the, in the case of uh, Macondo, they talked about it in all the reports had a good, you know, personnel safety record. And I think one of the, the things that it's a good, good to talk about as a result of uh, what's happened in the industry is the difference between the, the, you know, people say the slips, trips, and falls. I mean, that's extremely critical that you protect workers. It's extremely critical that you also have safety management systems that manage the execution of your work, you know, in a way that you get safe results. And those things, you know, work together, but they're not, you know, exactly the, 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 the same thing. And so I, I talk a lot about, you know, it's about the technology, and there's tremendous great technology, but technology has to get applied in a human system. The human system has to have a safety culture and be managed in a way that the technology you know, delivers the result and the safety you, you want. And so I think there, you know, there's a lot, you know, a lot of companies have focused on that already. Uh, and we discussed uh, the fact that, you know, that at least in Shell, you know, we've been using the safety case all over the world for a long time, which is, you know, is in our view is, is one of those systems that, uh, you know, manages um, safety from a system, you know, systemic standpoint. And I, you know, I think going forward, uh, the RP75, you know, what BOM's done, what's going to be done in the center around safety environmental management systems, is you know, is a is a great you know new place to be focused, and and I think those kinds of systems yield, uh, you know, total good you know results. And on your on your second question. Um, you know, when, um, you know, Secretary Chu spent a considerable amount of time directly down in the Gulf of Mexico working, you know, who's overseeing, supervising this, uh, the effort to, to cap the well and, and uh, end the flow of hydrocarbons in the Gulf of Mexico. And he came back from that experience with a number of observations and um, admonishments for us or encouragements for us in terms of how we, we refocus the, the research and development program. And, you know, one of the, one of the, the things he's mentioned and on a number of occasions is the fact that, uh, as was mentioned here, this is an industry of enormous scale. You'll spend $4 billion on a single ultra deep water development. You'll spend $100 million on a single ultra deep water dry hole off, you know, off the west coast of Nigeria. So it's, it's, a, it's a, a business of, ex, of extreme scope in which you don't want to have a competition between government and industry. One of the ways that you, you do these things effectively is to make sure that you take the subject matter expertise that you have within the Department of Energy and other areas, 30,000 engineers and scientists within our network of natural laboratories, and you augment that with the capital and the capabilities and investments that industry makes. So I, I think we do need to extend um, our collaborative efforts to ensure that there is a government expertise that's specifically geared towards understanding these issues. Uh, I think we do specifically have to ensure that we have government programs in the public interest that are working on quantifying the risks, particularly as the risks change as in this dynamic system as you go into to more, difficult, uh, more difficult environments. And there will be some investments that are made in, in, in ensuring that we do have some individual capabilities. But to say categorically right now that we're going to have a separate fleet of XYZ that we're going to be doing things in, uh, uh, completely independently, I think, would probably be immature or premature. Um, one of the works, one of the things that we're going to be doing through this uh, uh, safety committee, that's a federal advisory committee that's been established by Secretary Salazar at the Department of, of the Interior, is to take a specific look at some of these questions like the one that you, that you raise right now. So certainly the, the observation I can make now is that there certainly does need to be uh, scientific work that's done in the public interest to make sure that we quantify these risks in a way that's appropriate and that we have plans to respond. Um, 
but I, I, I'd suggest that some of the things that we need to do in the future are going to be leveraging the, the capital that's being spent by, uh, by companies. If I understand the question correctly, so we've had Admiral Allen here twice, and just to augment your answer, because I think mm -hmm. it's right, that a lot of people felt after Katrina and Rita that it was the same type of situation, but there's an Oil Spill Prevention Act that actually sets in place a legislative protocol. So when, when the management team was put in place, the operator was part of that interested parties group that had to assess the situation. Second issue on, on and I know the cameras, was a, a great deal of discussion within the White House and other places about looking at flow rate and how fast you could get there. Um, one of the points that Admiral Allen made was that in the, the space of like one acre of surface, at one point he said there was 900 vessels on the surface. And then if you look at below in the water column as well, managing that space. So he took control of airspace because helicopters were interfering, news helicopters and other things. But then he took control of sea space in terms of vessels that were there because they had to evacuate and move things around and then move equipment in and out and then also in the water column. So I, I, I think the first time the first time you do it, you find a lot of things that you would do better the second time. But I, we have to get over some protocol hurdles as well, I suspect. Go ahead. You had a question as well. Right on the left here. Aisha Roscoe with Reuters. Um, I had a question. I guess this is for Charlie Williams and whoever else is willing to answer. It seems like uh, uh, that there are definitely going to be changes to blowout preventers on rigs. And I was just wondering, what do you think is reasonable to expect as far as maybe retrofits or what new blowout preventers need to do to be more effective? And do you have concerns that the Interior Department could go too far in uh, establishing new requirements for blowout preventers. Oh, thanks. Well, you know, I think a lot of uh, you know what the uh, task group that we that we set up is already looking at are, are the things that uh, are going to occur with blowout preventers. Certainly, I think everybody knows blowout preventers. Um, you know, have been you know widely regulated and widely uh, tested. You know, I think, you know, certainly like uh, many things, and I think uh, actually Director Bromwich, I think he said this. At least I saw it on the Internet, so he must have said it. So, uh, uh, but, but anyway, the discussion was around airbags and, you know, how airbags have evolved. And, you know, and, and, and we went from, you know, front airbags to side airbags to all kinds of airbags. And, and I, I mean, I think technologies are that way. I mean, certainly I think all technologies have an opportunity to evolve. Uh, we've learned uh, a lot from this. We got uh, the opportunity to enhance, and I think most of the enhancements I think right now are going to be uh, around uh, how many multiple uh, rams do you want to have, like the shear rams. They're going to be around instrumentation. You know, there was uh, a general uh, uh, lack of, uh, of data. And, you know, data. You know, so you, you know, you'd like more pressure, more temperature. Uh, conceivably flow rate, although that's really difficult. You'd like to know around the positions of the rams when you operate them. All of those things, the way BOPs are today, were, were you know, relatively difficult to do. So certainly around uh, gathering data about the, uh, the situation with the blowout preventers is, is going to be important. And then certainly around uh, syst automatic control systems. You know, there were some automatic control systems. I think uh, certainly there'll be enhancements and improvements to those automatic control systems. And, and potentially other, you know, more, you know, automatic controls, you know. So, I mean, I think that's where it's going to go with blowout pre pre preventers as we move forward. Now, as all of you have seen from the pictures, and it's amazing that blowout preventers gotten to be such a common word now in the English language, but, but uh, uh, you know, these are incredibly big, you know, complicated devices. And so, you know, we're going to have to be deliberative in, 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 the, in the improvement of the devices. And, uh, and so, um, and, and there's lots of consequences. You know, we talk a lot about disconnecting from the blowout preventers and all. Well, the, the riser hooked to the blowout preventer ha is under a lot of tension. And so when you make an emergency disconnect, uh, I mean, there's consequences that result from that tension and all. So, so you have to make sure in your quest for you know, more automation 
and that you don't, you know, actually introduce, uh, you know, other different, you know, risk, you know, just because of the way the automatic control systems work. So it's a little bit different than the automatic controls on other things like uh, production platforms. So I think that has to be a, a thoughtful process about how we go that way. But I know, know there will be changes uh, there. And, you know, and I guess the other thing um, I'd, I'd just say real quickly about that is, is um, there was also another analogy, and I don't know who to attribute this to, but, but it, you know, it was again with the airbag analogy. And, and it was, uh, so if you're driving and you're getting ready to run into a wall, you don't just run into the wall and assume that your airbag's gonna inflate and you're gonna be saved. You know, you go through a process of you try to steer away, you know, you, you try to put on the brakes, and, and then, you know, the, the airbag activates. So blow-up preventers, like all kinds of other equipment, you know, have to be, be you know, operated in, in, in uh, the ways they were intended to be operated and within the design parameters that were designed for. So I think it's an important, you know, thing to, to always think about that equipment has to be operated that way. And, you, and so prevention, you know, is still uh, the, the, the key. Thanks. Is it a fair characterization, though, to say that, that Right now, we're looking at ways to adapt to existing capital stock, the, the stacks that we have in operation, but that the next generation of preventers might be different and enhanced. Yeah, you know, correct. I mean, we're going to, you know, we can make modifications to what we have, but in fact, of course, we're out there drilling now, and, and we're confident with the procedures, the practices, the operational practices that we have, you know, in, the, in, in drilling the well in general and in operating the BOPs, that it's, you know, that it's, you know, perfectly safe and, and the BOPs will. Are, uh, will, you know, will do their job. That's why we're out there drilling now. So, you know, th there will be changes. We can enhance what we have, and you know, later on there will be you know new new generations. One last question, anyone? You got it. No, you're okay. Thank you, Rosemary Urso from the Cohen Group. So, I have a question. Um, with regard to the Arctic, um, to ensure progress and continuity of oil and gas development um, in the region and also to better enable industry to respond to the increased safety standards, what steps is the government or industry taking to prevent that type of um, disruption to the developments already um, ongoing and also to better understand the unique properties um, being faced in the Arctic? Thank you. Anybody else want to? I guess. It's all yours, Chuck. Okay. So, um, you know, I, I think I'll talk, um, you know, I talk mostly, you know, for, for my company because I'm, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I mean, there's been, you know, a, quite a large amount of Arctic research done already, um, you know, about the environment, about uh, protecting the environment. There's been a lot of research done about, um, how you would address spills and control spills in the Arctic if you were unfortunate enough to have one. Uh, there's it's been a lot of that work's been done in Norway because it's actually you know difficult to do you know real experiments uh, about that, but you can do real experiments in Norway, and to to prove up uh, you know our thinking and, and our uh, you know spill cleanup and control techniques. In some ways, there's been a lot of discussion ar about this. I mean, of course, it would be you know, extremely unfortunate to have oil in the Arctic, but in some ways, uh, working on, on an Arctic spill uh, you know, could be better, or it could be easier to do than working on it in, in the Gulf. And, and we don't have a lot of time to talk about that, but, you know, but there's a lot of discussion in the industry about that. Certainly, where we are in the Arctic right now, it's, it's shallower. And, and we already have worked on uh, containment devices, which would be different there because it's shallow water because it's the Arctic than in the Gulf of Mexico, but we, you know, we're already you know, working on that. And, uh, and we've added, there was a lot of discussion around the Coast Guard and the Coast Guard response and the infrastructure. Certainly it's a remote you know, place, but you know, what we've done is add you know, all of uh, the spill control uh, vessels and equipment on site you know, for each uh, drilling site you know that you know, and so we put you know put that there ourselves, and you know, and it's readily on call, you know, right on the on the site. So, you know, we feel like that uh, there's been a huge effort put into uh, addressing specific Arctic problems, understanding the Arctic, and and being prepared for the Arctic, and and uh, we're confident about that. And thanks for the lead in. Actually, our next installment is going to be on the Arctic, <laughs> apropos. Um, thank you so much. And will you uh, join me in thanking our panel?